like the moon raker goes. Moon raker. I don't like Moonraker. That, neither do I. <laughs> the last one was A Spy Love Me, and it felt like a Bond back on solid ground. And this feels like Bond completely off solid ground and in zero gravity. And I guess we should probably mention why this movie exists in the form that it exists. First of what the makers of Star Wars hope will be thousands of queues started forming at 7am outside London's Dominion Cinema. The film, which has already outstripped the legendary Jaws as a money spinner in America, tells an outer space war story with strange monsters, robots and special effects all made in British studios. It's exciting, but I didn't like the bit when the man chopped off um, the person's arm. Why not? In the because there was blood. Oh, but we don't we like blood? No. It's clear that they're desperate to capitalise on the space craze that's happening in cinema. It feels to me a little bit like a um, a film that's, if you'll pardon the pun, lost in space. <laughs> doesn't quite know where it wants to be, doesn't even quite know how to capitalise on the success of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. The plan was that the next one would be For Your Eyes Only, Star Wars happened and then they changed tack. They said we're going to do something else that we can incorporate space and they went with Moonraker. Because Moon. It's a very early one, I think it's the third book uh, and it's nothing like this. In the book Bond basically goes to investigate, turns out to be a Nazi who's building a rocket base somewhere in Kent, I think. And he spends most of the first half of the book playing cards in a club um, on Pall Mall, and then a lot of the second half of the book in a cafe, and then ends up in a sort of rocket factory at the end. The movie is so far removed from the book, right. it takes the name and then there's one scene where they get strapped underneath the rocket and apart from that, there's nothing really to do with it. Uh, apart from the name, they kept the name Hugo Drax for the villain. There are elements in Moonraker where I think the filmmaking of the team are is, at the, is at its highest. Some amazing stunt work, some amazing cinematography, Amazing locations. Yeah, good, good effects, good, good effects, effects good, really great models, good sets, really good sets. And it feels like the worst of Bond just demeans all of those things at every fucking turn. So, like, all the fucking good things about this film are ruined. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. We are in the Roger Moore territory where things are sillier, mm. but I don't think this film tonally knows what it's doing. No, it doesn't. <laughs> They've thrown a hell of a lot of money at this. A lot of money. They've gone all in, and I don't think the gamble really pays off. I mean, financially, it did for them. Yeah. It did completely, because this made more money than any Bond film to that point, and it made more than any Bond film until Goldeneye. So it absolutely paid off financially. Could I interest you in something? Well, I'm tempted to say yes immediately. Can I use the staff toilets? I'm afraid I need a shit. <laughs> Please, go anywhere you wish. Ooh. 
So we did the drinking game. We won't explain the rules, the rules will be down below. Amazingly, because the last time we did this it was what, 165 drinks I think? Mm -hmm. Which almost killed me. <laughs> because this was 170 drinks. The reason why you've got so many drinks in, in this is because everybody says the name Bond. James Bond, James Bond. Mm -hmm. All the way through and it's drink, 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 drink. The Bond, the Bond. Bond, Mr. Bond, sir. Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond. And then at the end you've got a shitload of explosions. I repeat. The plot of Moonraker is simultaneously very simple and very, very complex. Start of the movie, basically a space shuttle is hijacked. And we don't know what's happened, we don't know who's hijacked it, and Bond is put on the trail, go and find out what's happened. He goes to Hugo Drax, who is this sort of French industrialist billionaire character, who owns the, the company that makes the space shuttles, and he goes to meet him. And basically while he's there, he's tipped off by an employee that something isn't quite right about Drax's operation. And he's basically told you need to look into this thing because something isn't quite right here. And through a series of massive contrivances, Bond finds out that Drax is trying to wipe out the entire human race and replace them with this special um, sort of army of hot people. Per perfect humans, the master race, who will replace the human race once he's wiped them all out. Since we started doing these, in between, there was already a virus that was ravaging the world, but now we now have billionaires flying into space against the world's best interests. It's amazing that um, they had they were so far ahead of their time, they were 30 odd years ahead of their time. The idea that these horrible billionaire assholes would be using space as their own sort of private fiefdom. Yeah. And hey, they got it, I'll tell you what, it may have sounded like nonsense. At the time they said, this is bollocks and we've been inspired by Star Wars. And yeah. now we're living the reality of Moonraker, where rich assholes go to space for a laugh. To all you kids down there, I was once a child with a dream, looking up to the stars. Now, I'm an adult in a spaceship with lots of other wonderful adults. One down, two to go. Because we've, we've had before in these films where Doctor knows very much two halves, there's the there's the clues and the build-up, and then there's the Mad Island adventure. Uh, you only live twice is the, uh, let's do the investigation, and there's a fucking volcano thing. This, after about a third, just goes and goes mental, and is crap from then on in, I would say. Bad. <laughs> Chubby Broccoli again on his own. Everything I say that Chubby Broccoli did right in The Spy Who Loved Me, he does wrong here. It feels like a money grab uh, from Star Wars. Mm. And there are product placements throughout the film, but. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Seven up, have a fag, and then go on British Airways. Yes, yeah. Fuck off. The reason I hate this, this is the worst bond for me up to this point, is the greed seeps. Chubby Broccoli's greed is coming out of his <laughs> pores. 
like, like, well, I want this to make more money, and I want the advertisement and star. It's it's Stellan Skarsgård in Dune. That's how I pictured <laughs> Chubby Broccoli in this film. And Chubby Broccoli has, after the spy me, Chubby Broccoli was king. You know, he he'd done so many wonders and made so many great films. And there's something about this that I just find greedy and disgusting and lame. My impression uh, as to how Chubby Broccoli approaches this has kind of always been, with The Spy Love Me, I think you've got the impression that he realised that things had gone off the boil and that he had to bring something back to something that was approaching a recognisable bond. Mm. With this, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I get the impression with this, for me, he's just gone, the last one people liked, I'm going to hop aboard the sci-fi craze, but I'm also I, I what I want to do is give people more. So I'm going to go bigger and bigger and bigger. So yeah. he's increased the budget by almost double, I think. I think it's, I think it's twice the price of any other Bond film to this point. And he's just gone more, more, more. I want to give the people what they want. I don't know if it's a sort of cynical, greedy thing, but there's a real, at the very least, there's a misplaced just spaffing with his money. Do more, do more, yeah. what we need is more. Get people in, do more, more, more. And then even also with the money that the last one made, he brings back Lewis Gilbert. And, yeah. and I, I love Lewis Gilbert's previous two films. Lewis Gilbert is basically the epic Bond director. Mm. You only live twice, spy love me. And then this one. Well, it, it feels like a man working with a script that doesn't know where it's going and yeah. they don't know what they're doing other than bigger and better, please. Blah! <laughs> <laughs> what is he doing? Woo! <laughs> Sorry, me. He also brings back John Barry, mm -hmm. who I like some of it. I think it's a score that kind of gets lost a little bit. The sequence where they want it to work, it works, which is the reveal of the spacecraft mm. is good effects meets good score and it feels like something that should matter. There is the throwback to... <laughs> Interesting because it's something we've seen with the, the latest no Bond. Time no time to die. It's a referencing a previous Bond movie with your score. We've now get ready for this in 2028 when we finally when, get ready round to filming that. Well, it was fascinating when we sat in the cinema and watched it about three weeks ago. Mm. More fireworks, sorry. Going on. Um, as we were sitting there in the cinema, it was just I couldn't help myself counting the drinks and going. This is a big one. This is a really big one. I'm not looking forward to doing this. I, 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 I am. am. I am. Yeah. I am. Eventually, we're going to just be sick doing one of these. Yeah. <laughs> I think Goldeneye might. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, think he, so, yeah. He mows so, down people. Uh, I, that's going to be 200 drinks, I think. Yeah. Goldeneye. <laughs> oh, God. And one of my favorite ones. The big thing here, I think, is this is Bond in space. The fact is, this exists because Star Wars made a lot of money. But, also, Chubby Broccoli's philosophy was that it shouldn't be science fiction, it should be science fact. Mm -hmm. So what you have here, I think, at the end, is this odd mishmash of aesthetics, where nothing quite works very well. You've got a foot in both camps and nothing really excels. So, and if you watch the um, Inside uh, Moonraker documentary, one of the things that the crew, you know, the, the special effects team are very, very proud of is that they managed to find a really elegant way of making the space station explode realistically. And they talk about how in space um, 
there's no flames because there's a vacuum, so there's no oxygen, so flames can't appear. Eventually what you do is they got a shotgun and they basically just shot the model with a shotgun. If you watch it, it's really, really good, but it's this odd thing where they've spent a lot of time thinking about how they can realistically make a space station explode, but also it's a movie where several dozen space marines appear in jetpacks with laser guns. <laughs> We're not science fiction, we're in fact science fact. Half let's do it realistically and half let's do it slightly ridiculously. And you end up with something that doesn't do either particularly well. Real mess of a movie that's trying to incorporate these uh, outer space sci-fi influences that isn't very good as a film that is openly quoting a movie that is so much better than yes. it. as is 2001 as is um, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly yes and oh God, I forget, yeah, I forgot to get this whole I... cowboy bit in the middle. <laughs> so it's a real Mel Brooks film. <laughs> <laughs> Moore's back. Um, he's looking old. He's starting to really look his age. He's got. Yeah. He looks like a sort of a, an old wrinkly conker. If you look he's at his, leathery. He's leathery. He's starting to look his age. He's looking at too many. Summers on the Riviera, mm -hmm. that he's been enjoying the Bond money. You can see the, the sort of lines in his face. You know what? I think he kind of. He isn't too old yet. He gives a. He, I don't think he has to do a great deal. He's got one more in him. He just about holds himself together and gives a decent account of himself, but he. Oh boy, he is starting to look. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the limit, he's he's pushing the limit. I think of what what you would expect to see for your globe trotting outer space spy hero. Outer arrow. space hero. Yeah. You missed, Mister Bond. Did I? Hugo Drax, played by Michael Lonsdale. He's great. Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. He's one of the few good things about Moonraker. At least I shall have the pleasure of putting you out of my misery. He's my favorite thing in this. He's great. He's quietly an asshole. He isn't bombastic. He's not a... Um, He's not a sort of over-the-top villain. There's something about him that is just innately very, very charismatic, which I really like. But he kind of outshines almost everybody else in it. He really does, yeah. James Bond, you appear with the tedious inevitability of an unloved season. I didn't think there were any seasons in space. As far as you're concerned, only winter. He's given good dialogue as well. He is, he is, he really is. He's and he, and he nails that dialogue. He does. May I press you to a cucumber sandwich? Uh, thank you, no, nothing at all. I'd say a sizable problem with Goldfinger is... Goldfinger? <laughs> I'd say a, I, I, I'd say a big problem with Moonraker is Lois Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say... A sizable problem with Moonraker is Lois Childs. Where's Drax? Oh, he had to fly. How's Scott doing? He's got control of the command satellite. We put the launching gear for the globes out of action. The station breaks up. Yeah, it's fine. We're going to get out of it. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> but the three that are she's awful. In her defense, she's got a really tedious character. But um, she's a oh, completely lifeless performance. She spends all oh, the last half an hour just stood with her arms crossed, yeah. doing nothing. I mean, it's a really 
uh, it, it's it's a badly written, underwritten, tedious character. She's got not a lot to work with, and she does nothing with it. It's getting hot. Can't be helped. I'm coming in at a steeper angle than I should in order to catch that last glow. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Honestly, it's like they're trying to make it boring. I can't hold this course much longer. No. <laughs> it's like she's struggling with a crossword. What's nine down? She's got an embarrassing name. Holly Goodhead. Lois Maxwell. Not Lois Maxwell. <laughs> Child. Lois Childs. She's great in something like broadcast news, she, she's a good actress. Uh, this just all fell very, very, very flat in this movie. Mm. So I think this is one of the more divisive things of the movie. So Jaws is back. Jaws, who is this fantastically charismatic, mm -hmm. sort of silent villain from The Spy Love Me. Richard Keel is this incredible physical specimen. Looks absolutely brilliant. Looks like, you know, a wrestler or mm -hmm. something. Uh, amazing, just tailor made for a, a super villain. Yeah. And used probably almost perfectly in The Spy Love Me. And then clearly there was this outpouring of support for for the character of Jaws and Richard and Richard Keel as a performer that they wanted him back and they brought him back and they brought him back with. The best way, I think the most generous way to describe it is mixed results. Don't stop pulling stuff <laughs> off the space station! Metal bollocks as well, apparently. <laughs> Balls. <laughs> oh, you can get him. Basically, the big thing about Jaws is he turns up, he's a villain, and over the course of the movie, he turns into a good guy and gets a girlfriend. but it literally begins with an incredible action sequence. I mean, it's an action sequence from the end of Point Break. Yeah, People... all fucking a new Mission Impossible movie. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, Bond thrown out of a plane, he's got no parachute on and he has to fight a guy on the way to the ground to, to get a parachute and survive, and it's amazing. And if you watch the Inside uh, Moonraker documentary, they talk at a length about how they, like the practical challenges of doing this, they had to put head mounted cameras on people, they had to build different lenses so they were lighter because um, when you pulled the rip cord, like the, the weight of the camera would break it, break, break, break the stuntman's neck. So they had to build their own lenses and different cameras and they did, I think it was something like 88 jumps out of planes just to get this five minutes on film. And it's amazing, and when you watch it, it looks incredible. Okay, mm -hmm. you can sort of tell it's a stuntman, but it gives a fucking shit. It's, it's two people flying through the air, one of which looks like they don't have a parachute. It's brilliant, it's amazing. And then added to that, for reasons that don't quite compute, they've decided Jaws is going to be in it as well. He doesn't even seem to have a place on the plane at the start of the movie, and they've just put him in. You shoehorn Jaws in and you end it with a joke of him landing in a circus big top. And I assume getting caught in the trapeze net, although it's not it's entirely not made clear. Why have you ruined this? Now, regarding a replacement for Char, you have someone in mind? Oh yes, well, if you can get him, of course. Who's he talking to? I... Maybe it's not a gag yet. Henchman Direct. It is, yeah, the Henchman Recruitment Agency. Imagine that you didn't see Jaws in that opening, because you don't need him and you don't need that And you could gag. have had someone else come in and have the same sequence where another guy attacks James Bond yeah. and James the Bond fights one. Just yeah. the co-pilot. Or the lady. What happened to the lady on the plane? Who, yeah, who she, knows? She just crashed. Crashed. Imagine that the first time you see Jaws in this movie is his back as he walks through airport security and everybody's looking at him and it's after Drax says, 
who can I get? That guy? And oh, he's back. And then the first time you see his face, he smiles. The what an, what an entrance. Yeah. What an entrance. That's your hero shot. That's yeah. almost as as good as Bond. Yes. And it you also makes... What an entrance that would have been. It what makes a entrance. sense of the rubbish henchman with the kendo stick. Yes. Where he needed a better one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And now he's a threat to James Bond's, you know, mission. Play it again, Sam. The scariest sequence in the movie comes after he hires him, when they go to Rio, and he's in the big clown costume. It's incredible. This is the one thing I remember most vividly from this movie as a child, is this scene. Uh, the Rio carnival, and they, they went and shot footage of the genuine carnival. And then they also did, um, like, sort of pickups where they recreate it as well but also while we're on the subject why the fuck is Bond in a dinner jacket at the Rio Carnival it must be fucking what 30 degrees humid as as fuck sweating out of his ass why the fuck would you wear a suit to a carnival <laughs> brilliant moment where you see the this clown's head and the idea that Bond is moving and your eye is drawn to the clown's head, but then also the shot of him walking down the alley, I think is fantastic. Yep. I think it's genuinely frightening. It's it's something out of a, a horror movie. It really is, and I and I remember that vividly from my childhood watching this movie and being terrified by the clown. And then when you find out it was Jaws, I was just excited because it was Jaws. But I remember that image of that clown. It was a fantastic thing that they that they put into this movie. And then they kind of ruin it with just some like revelers go ha da 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 and just move on the most dangerous man in the world. The biggest man in Brazil. <laughs> the cable cut sequence. Yes. Jaws stops it because they needed them to be on the outside for a stunt. What's wrong? I don't know. And I'm sure we're better off out than in. Why? Mm, mm -hmm. No reason, other than we want the stuntman to fall over the edge of the cable car with no wire, apparently. And then Jaws comes up. They have a fight which is predominantly done on, not green screen, but in studio and looks terrible. Mm. And then there's a sequence where Bond goes, Grab on! And he like gets his jacket over and he swings down. And then they pretend as if they can get a cable car to go as fast as him. And this all leads into a 7-Up commercial that leads into just a blonde woman is there and Jaws goes... You've completely ruined your greatest villain. Imagine that if that happened in Empire Strikes Back. The Maybe. Darth Vader and yeah. someone has got a girlfriend. I think that cable car sequence is kind of a microcosm for the rest of the movie. Because that rest of the movie feels like a lot of uh, locations in search of a, a script. The cable car fight scene makes no sense whatsoever. The idea that Bond, for no reason, just gets out of the cable car and they stand on the cable cars to fight each other is complete gibberish. This looks great. How do we get this in, this in the movie? I don't care. Just get it in. absolutely awful, it's a complete joke, it isn't funny, you've brought back the man who stares at his booze, it's crap. Q makes practical weapons, he doesn't make gondola weapon ships, because why would you? 
and also the sequence in the Amazon. You've got James Bond in the Amazon and you've got a piece of shit sequence where he's going around in his gadget ship and then flies away and it's all comedy. I don't think they pull off anything in this movie. Well, here's to us. Don't worry, they'll make it. It's only 100 miles to Earth. This is my least favourite Bond film up to this point. Okay. I think it's a piece of crap. It costs a lot of money. And um, it made its money back, and that's what annoys it, me. It made more than its money back. It was incredibly successful. I genuinely think this is a film with the least sense and care with just a complete drive towards money. And I hate it. <laughs> I, I hate this film because the greed of chubby broccoli wanting a bit more liver in his guts. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. They've got a budget and they've got these wonderful, talented people. Costume, costumes. They look cool. <laughs> Cinema sets, Ken sets. Adams, Ken Adams sets. We don't need to go into detail, but Ken Adams sets are brilliant. Yeah, special effects, music, you've got all these wonderful things, and you undercut it with just complete ridicule. It means nothing. You want money. I really dislike Moonraker. And I bought a stupid fucking spacesuit. It's not even a spacesuit, this is from Amazon. If I went to space, I'd die. Which is where they went in the movie, is it? What, space? The Amazon. They, they did go to the Amazon. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And, you know, Captain Kirk went to space. Sort of. They just go up there and... Oh, it's so awful. I mean, just the thinking of it. We're not science fiction. We're, in fact, science fact. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> 